All right. I think we waited enough. So if someone else has to join, they'll join in us. In they'll join in sometime. All right. Hello to everyone and uh, welcome to the second lecture of CP one zero one. Uh, give me a second. I will share my screen. Right. Uh, yeah. I hope my screen is visible to all. All right. Let's begin. Okay. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the second lecture of CP one zero one. Today, uh, we will be looking at a couple of very important things that are uh, very often used in competitive programming and. I think after today's lecture, you guys will be much more comfortable in solving many more problems. All right. Uh, so the first thing we begin with is something known as an array. So I want to start with a very basic question. All right. Let's look. Let's go to the yes. Uh, so I have a very basic question. Uh, let's say there's a class of five people, right? So the teacher uh, gets has the marks of all the five people, and she wants to write a very simple program to find the average of those marks. So simple, she writes um, int s one, s two, three, four, s five. Maybe not int because it's average. So let's write double. Okay. Then she takes in all the marks, make it interactive. You can do it. Correct. अरे यार तूने वजह से क्या करा यार अपना प्रॉब्लम था। Yeah. So we have all the marks and we definitely just got to output the average, right? Which will be S1 plus S2. Five five. I hope you all are with me until now. So let's clear the output. Input is any five numbers. So fifty-five, forty-three, thirty-two, fifty-six, twenty-five. Let's say it's that five numbers, and we're just gonna run it. Uh, that's don't that doesn't seem to be an error. Yeah. So yeah, we've got the answer, but. Now let's say the teacher has 50 students in our class. Uh, do you, obviously, it's not feasible to write 50 variables here, right? Uh, storing 50 variables and then you have to input all the 50 separately and then run uh, to just find the average. You have to add 50 numbers here by yourself and uh, do stuff like that. Now let's may take the problem up another notch. What if the class strength is unknown while the program is being written? what if the program is needed to be general like any class can apply this so we can see the problem with just having primitive variables right like double or float they there are only single variables and they have to be predefined in number right so this is where array array help us all right so what is an array an array is a series of elements basically you can think of it like a list of integers where you can access anything in the like any integer in the list for example uh, if you look at the visualization in front of you uh, the size of the array is 6 so you, there is a there is a list of six numbers uh, and you can access any one of those six by just writing an index you don't have to declare six variables only one array is declared and then you can access any of these six all right so they are stored in contiguous memory locations it's not something very important but it's nice to know uh from a competitive programming point of view so basically an array is a somewhat of a list that can store all the elements so if you have a class size of let's say 100 you just have to declare one array of size 100 and you can store all the elements all the marks of the students inside the array that that's a very convenient way right so like looking at a very basic implementation of what an array is so this line here int wait uh yeah int marks 10 right so what this line says is you are declaring a marks an array called marks which has a size of 10 basically it can store 10 elements in it and the data type is int 
right so this another example called string names 10 basically you are storing 10 names which are all of the format string so this a very this has been given the values also and i'll show you more ways of accessing the values but let's try to run this and try to see how it works so we're going to go here and what we're going to do is uh we're going to instead of all this we're going to say double marks of 5 we're going to show five students marks right i hope this is very clear the array's name is marks the size of the array is 5 and the data type is double right so you first okay one more uh, important point i forgot to mention is how you access every element of the array is through something called an index so you see here this is x of 0 it's like the way you read it out is x of 0 so x of 0 is the element in the array x at index 0 so the indexing in computer science starts with 0 and not 1 so always keep that in mind so x of 0 refers to 19 which is the first element in the array as the first element is x of 0 or 19 so if i am looking at the fifth element which will be 1 2 3 4 5 it is x of 4 right uh, let's write some code so we can understand it better okay so what we're going to do is we're going to take input so marks of 0 is how you refer to the first element marks of 1 marks of 2 and marks of 4 right so all five have been taken into consideration and you just have to sum them up here and uh, basically yeah okay so that seems right so we run the same input let's see if the output works and we get the exact same output right that means it works but uh, you might say this is also like a lot of work right so loops will fix this problem but we will come to it later all right also like gunjan if you feel like at any point you need to cut in feel free to cut in all right yeah so we learned some things basically you can access the element by its index right so let forget the average let's say i want to output the fifth element so see out and the way to access the fifth element would be marked at the index 4 right so 4 let's see if it works so the input was 55 43 32 56 25 and the last number is 25 and that is what we got in the output basically we were able to access the fifth element directly right yeah so that is the basic concept of an array basically it stores everything in a list and you can directly access all the elements of that list right uh yeah so basically if you want to access the kth element you write x of k minus 1 right that was pretty much it let's move on to loops so uh, a loops are one more convenient way to solve a lot of problems basically you so you saw in the score that i'm doing a lot of repeated stuff right the only thing that changing while i'm taking input is the number of the element i'm accessing everything else is same i'm still writing marks I'm still writing the brackets. I'm only changing the number, right? So we are doing something repetitive, and loops are something that will help solve, like do stuff repeat repeatedly, while writing a very concise code, right? So basically, loops repeat instructions until a certain condition remains true. So in the loop, you'll have a certain condition that you'll have to specify. As long as it's true, you will keep repeating the same thing, right? so there's two kinds of loops entry control loops and exit control loops uh, it's just a broad definition and it's not really important but what an entry control loop does is it checks the condition of the loop at the beginning and an exit control loop checks the condition at the end that will make more sense in a while 
so yeah let's look at the first loop uh, i think uh, okay well we look at the most basics of a loop all right so uh, a loop has something called a loop variable uh, which you've got to initialize basically like let's say int i is equal to 1 so the variable gets updated after every iteration of the loop so you can say you can maybe increase the variable by 1 by 2 you can multiply the variable by 5 it's up to you right based on what you want to accomplish with the loop i know things might be a little hard to understand right now but when we get to the loops things will become very clear so uh, also there's some shorthand notations here i is equal to i plus 1 is the same as i plus plus uh, basically it does the same thing it takes i it increases the value of i by 1 and stores it back into i the shorthand notation of that would be i plus plus same thing with i is equal to i plus 2 i plus equal to 2 so you can write any number here i plus equal to n and it will become i is equal to i plus n if you want you can divide the number by 5 by writing it in the shorthand it's not really a compulsory thing it just speeds things up a, a little bit yeah and then there is a the main part of the loop which is the termination condition right so basically it's a condition that usually has the initialization variable in it and it, every loop uh, while is checking in the condition it'll check if the condition returns true it will continue to another iteration of the loop otherwise it'll exit the loop it can be anything like i is less than 10 or n is greater than 0 where n and i are variables okay now let's look a let's look at a basic loop and we'll be able to understand right so this is uh, this is something called a for loop right so that is the basic syntax of a for loop basically how a for loop works is uh, you just write for and you declare the loop variable here int i is equal to 0 things might seem a little hard but give me a few minutes you'll be very comfortable soon int i is equal to 0 is the initialization variable the advantage of like for loops is you can do all the initialization termination and updation in the one line you don't have to write some extra lines for it it's a very concise form of a loop so you declare the loop variable to be 0 now your termination condition is i is less than 5 and your updation variable says i is equal to i plus plus which basically means i is equal to i plus 1 let's write this code here and see what happens all right let's clear the output there is no requirement of any input yeah let's run it let's see what happens very simple right so what happened is the compiler first goes to the main main function because that's what the c++ compiler looks for it comes in it sees the for loop right so it sees the for loop it defines the up initialization variable in type to be one it sees the condition which is i less than equal to 5 it checks if the condition is currently true as soon as the compiler enters the loop it checks the condition right so i is equal to 1 obviously i is less than equal to 5 so it goes into the loop it prints out the value of i next what happens is it's going to come here and it's going to go and update the variable currently so i becomes i plus plus what does mean what that means is uh currently i i is equal to i was equal to 1 then you did an i plus plus i became equal to 2 it's a very simple thing i plus plus increased the value of i by 1 and stored it in i right so i is equal to 2 now now the update the initialization happens only in the first time after that the compiler forgets about it and leaves it alone it comes and checks the condition again It is two less than equal to five. True, right? So it goes back into the loop and does whatever the loop wants it to do. So that's a very simple. So two got printed. Then it went out, updated i. It became three now. Came in, printed three again. Went back, updated i. Became four now. We are getting closer to five. Became four now. Came here, printed four. Went back up, updated the variable. it becomes 5 now 5 is still lesser than equal to notice the equal to it's not lesser than this less than and equal to 5 right that returns true 
so it comes back out prints five now the loop, uh, loop variable goes here it becomes six and when it checks the condition obviously six is not less than equal to five returns false right so the loop decides to terminate and the next thing that happens is it continues to the next part which is nothing it just returns okay let's write return zero so the function returns all right that was pretty much it very simple example i um, want you all just a second yeah so that's uh, yeah code. yeah so uh, one thing you should note about the syntax of for loop is that um since the initialization condition and the updation are all separated by semicolon so uh, you cannot put a comma or anything else there and they are all written in one line yeah. so this is a different syntax than might be what you have been uh, seeing till now but it makes things very easy because everything is at one place and you can uh, see everything very clearly also for the curly braces so you can see those curly braces there are blocks like we we'll discussed in the last lecture blocks are used whenever we want to associate more than one statement so if you have more than one statement that you want to repeat again and again and again and again so what you will do you will create a block for this for and you will put uh, this all the statements inside that block so here we are using only one statement but ho sakta in future you can use more than one uh, statement so in that case the block will be helpful and for for we are using that normal bracket that is parenthesis that is the syntax of for so we cannot change that so yeah just keep in mind the syntax so uh, that will help you also uh, siddharth can you zoom into the screen when you are writing code control plus yeah 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 I'm sorry uh, about this is that. much better yeah yeah all right guys uh yeah uh, all right so that was the yeah let's do something let's write uh i is equal to 5 i is equal to 1 i is equal to i star 2 this can also be written as i star but uh, for uh, to make it as clear as possible i'm just adding i is equal to i star 2 now let's see what happens right okay i actually i want you guys to guess in the yeah. chat yeah that will be a better option all right so write in the chat what should be the output for this code yeah come on you guys you can go go iteration by iteration it should not be a very hard problem भैया आप जो कोड लिख रहे हो उसके स्क्रीनशॉट भी लेते रहोगे तो बाद में हमें मतलब बहुत अच्छे से मतलब और ज्यादा अच्छी समझ में आ सकता है ये जो पूरा लेक्चर है इट इज रिकॉर्डेड एंड इट विल बी अपलोडेड टू यूट्यूब सो आप यू कैन वॉच इट वेन एवर यू वॉन्ट आप कभी भी देख पाओगे इस लेक्चर को तो टेंशन मत लो उस चीज की All right. So the answer is one, two, four. Let's see how that how that works. All right. So obviously the main function is uh, got called. It uh, the compiler comes here, looks at the for, initializes i is equal to one. Right. So. All right. That's a multi-line comment. Comment is basically something that the compiler ignores. and it is only for the user to understand how the code works so i got initialized to 1 all right it checked i is less than equal to 5 true so it went into the loop it comes here it prints i so one got printed out right so prints one then it comes here updates i i is equal to i into 2 so one is uh, i is equal to 1 into 2 which is equal to 2 so i became 2 right then 2 is less than equal to 5 is the next thing that is checked true so it comes here and prints 2 right the next thing is it goes back here and it does i is equal to 2 into 2 because 
because i is currently 2 right so 2 into 2 right so i is, is equal to 4 then it comes here it checks is 2 less than 4 2 less than equal to 4 also true so it goes ahead and it prints 4 the next thing that happens is i is equal to 4 into 2 which is equal to 8 now obviously 8 is not less than equal to 5 false so exit so we come out of the loop there is no more statements to execute and we return basically i hope uh, how a basic loop works is clear now right let's look at right yeah okay i want you guys to tell me the output for the second loop here for int i is equal to 0 i less than 100 and i star is equal to 2 Yeah, I'll wait for a few seconds. Until then, I'll write the same code there. Yeah, I'm looking at the responses. I is equal to zero. Yeah. Okay. So if you see two inverted commas and there is nothing between them, basically that is a space. So space, yeah. Yeah. Two. So that you can view it easily. By default, it will not give a space. So if you if you'd have printed like this, it would have been one, two, three, four, five, without any yeah. space. Yeah. Wait. I'll try. I'll try showing that first. Mm-hmm. So if I were to print like this, right? Uh, so the output comes out to look looking like one twenty four, but it was actually one. Then two was printed. Then four was printed. Right. To be able to make sure that we can see things clearly, we print a space out. We can also print a new line here. Which will put the answers in a different line. It's the same. We just like to put a space because it makes viewing the answer easier. Right. All right. Uh, moving back okay, to the so original question. Many are saying I, that it is a infinite loop which is printing zero every time. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Wait. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure all of you are clear. it's giving a runtime error because the compiler this online compiler will not run till infinity if you run it locally the program will keep running and there will be nothing to stop it unless you force close it so this closes after 0.01 seconds so it realizes that the program is not ending in that much time so it stops printing but basically as you can see it's only printed zeros why did that happen let's see let's clear the output okay so we came in start a comment all right so the compiler comes here sets i to 0 so i is equal to 0 goes to the next condition checks is i less than equal to 100 i less than equal to 100 true comes here prints 0 and prints a space next updates the value of i to i is equal to 0 into 2 is equal to 0 okay now maybe some people who didn't get it earlier start to understand why Things were repeating. Now i is still zero, and i is zero, zero less than hundred, less than equal to hundred. Prints the zero out, comes back, update zero to zero again, i to zero again, because i is equal to zero star two equal to zero. So the value of i is not changing at all, and that is creating the problem, right? So that is why this leads to an infinite loop. Basically, it keeps printing zeros. Until the program either gets stopped or never, basically until forever. Right. So there's a couple more things. If let's say you have another variable outside int count is equal to one, and you want to run the loop with the condition of count and you don't need the loop variable, you can choose to leave this empty. You can say count is less than hundred. Uh, let's say ten. It's easier to see. And you can also update anything here you don't have to only update the loop variable you can update anything here all right count so very simple program if you guys yeah i think we can wait for answers for a few seconds here the only thing you shouldn't technically leave empty is the termination condition 
I think if you leave it empty, it gives it assumes it to be true, right, Kunjan? हाँ, it will be an infinite loop. Yeah, yeah. भैया. Unless, हाँ हाँ. भैया उधर है ना ये जो है ना वो कहाँ जो for है ना for के बाद जो bracket है उधर आपने comma डाल उसको cut करो क्योंकि वहाँ पे error आएगा. नहीं आएगा ना. एक second. I'll run it. देखना error नहीं आएगा. And then I'll explain why error नहीं आया. Right. right so there was no error and the output is 1 to 4 and 8 so basically this semicolon specifies to the compiler that if there was a variable that had to be initialized it is initialized before the semicolon so the compiler understands that there is no variable to initialize to be initialized and this this semicolon tells the compiler the second one that the com- condition comes between the first semicolon and the second semicolon now i could also do this it is totally up to me and you see the order is still the same you print then you check the condi- uh, then you update then you check the condition it's just that the for loop gave you the advantage that you could put it here itself instead of writing a spe- extra line here right you'll see the output is still the same yeah exactly the same right so i hope i make more sense now if we want to look at an infinite loop we can just give empty for loops and it just print powers of 2 and then move into negative stuff very fast yeah all right so we can ignore the negatives but i think everyone gets the point the negative happened because it went outside the range of an integer right cool let's move ahead yeah i think we've done stuff so we've covered this yeah a few more questions for you guys all of you i want you guys to solve these two questions and write the answers in the chat let's see how many of you get it right yeah first just the first one go for the first one yeah yeah and read the question properly again bhaiya wo pehle kis wo pichla last slide aap dikha sakte ho yeah yeah okay we have a uh, variation in answers here all right very some are saying there is an infinite loop which will print one a few in are saying one? 0 1 2 3 4 okay. and a few are saying 0 to 9 very so nice these are the three options i can see in this, the chat. these yeah. questions are slightly tricky and i hope after i've explained these you'll be able to understand loops much more clearly hmm. let's take a look we might have to move a little fast here but let's see all right uh, so So uh, let's try to. Do you want me to run it first, and then I'll explain? I think that will be better. So let's clear the output. Right. Let's run it. Okay. There's an error. Oh, uh, give me a sec. Okay. Okay. It doesn't recognize those codes. yeah so the answer is 0 1 2 3 4 now let's take a look at why this happened all right now this is why you need to write it on a piece of paper to be able to understand properly so yeah let's see so first the compiler came to the main function looked at the definition of limit so limit got set to 10 i am sorry not lim- limit lim got set to 10 all right i got set to 0 as soon as it came into the loop 
and it checks if i is less than lim which is true so it goes into the loop prints 0 right next lim becomes lim lim minus minus all right so this is similar to lim plus plus or i plus plus basically what that does is lim is equal to lim minus 1 right wait i'll write it here so that means lim has become 9 now lim is equal to 9 then it comes to the end of the loop goes to the updation condition i plus plus which makes i is equal to 1 because i was originally 0 it checks is 1 less than 9 still true moves on repeats the process all right so let's see what happens now one second so uh it prints one of course then it goes back adjust lim to 8 goes to the updation part i becomes 2 i plus plus right 2 is less than 9 still true 2 less than 8 still true print 2 lim becomes 7 i becomes 3 print 3 lim becomes 6 i becomes 4 print 4 right i hope i'm making sense it's just the same thing that's happening again and again i i goes up by 1 lim goes up by 1 if the condition is true it prints it so currently we have i is 4 lim is 6 and 4 just got printed right now after the print statement lim has come down to 5 i has gone up to 5 in the updation and it comes here and it checks is 5 less than 5 so 5 less than 5 returns false hence we leave the loop and we exit and basically the program ends so that is why the output was 0 1 2 3 4 right i hope it's making sense now so let's look at the next one i want you guys to write the answer i want more people to get the answer right now because now they have more understanding of what is going on right take your time and uh, yeah just work on it yeah just keep in mind that the loop works on the termination condition so uh, it does not matter what is the loop variable or what is the updation you should have the condition should be true so Yeah. Like in the previous case, I was zero and it was written I less than lim. So as I said, it will check initially that I is less than ten. Usko it will run ten times. It will not happen like that. The condition will be checked on each and every step. So if your condition changes at each and every step, you will have to take care of that. Correct. Exactly what Gunjan is saying. No outputs. Okay, people. Some people are saying no output. Anybody else? Okay, fine. I think I can just run it now. Error as well. Somebody said. Someone is saying error. Okay, let's see. We'll find uh -huh. out. Let's first clear the output. Delete the comments. By the way, what Siddharth is doing, writing in comments and uh, and uh, basically seeing the flow loop is called a dry run. so yeah. whenever you are writing like you are just starting out programming so sometimes loops can do weird things which you don't expect so try to write the entire flow on a piece of paper just like you wrote on the screen and see that where exactly is your condition failing or you are doing a wrong update so you will be able to debug very easily because sometimes in loops the values can go till infinity or something can happen so always try to dry run it when you are getting an error all right that is pretty much what the entire snippet was let's run it okay so there is nothing of any output so let's see what has we happened uh let's print here entering the loop yes right 
so it entered and it exited so there was no problem in the code except that it never really went into the loop only because you define limit lim to be zero let's see let's try to dry run it now lim zero equal to zero i is equal to lim which is also equal to zero and the first thing it does is it comes in and checks the condition is i greater than lim is zero greater than zero it returns false hence it exits the loop without executing anything right so i hope that makes sense now let's go on so this is relating to the problem we looked at at the start i iterating through an array i'll not write the exact same snippet of code here i'll relate it back to the problem we discussed right so initial let's say that the teacher says that there can be any number of students in the class she wants to use the same program for all the classes she teaches in the school so obviously every class will have a different strength so let us say that the strength of the class is strength a variable called strength right so what you're going to do you're going to take the strength as input the next thing you're going to do is now that you know the strength so for each student you need to store his marks so you'll store a array of doubles strength because you are trying to look at the average if you remember the problem uh double marks and the size of the array will be strength all right so what we did here is we have made an array called marks this will store the marks of everyone in the class and the size of the array is strength which is the strength of the class now it makes i hope it makes sense so what we're going to do is now we need to take the input of everyone's marks so we'll run a for loop so the first thing is int i is equal to let's say i'm going to write x you guys are going to tell me what that x is going to be i is less than strength i plus plus cn marks of i all right can we have the chat filled up with the answer to what x should be भैया एक डाउट है मुझे i plus plus का कोई परपस i plus plus means i plus plus is the updation of i variable it can also mean i is equal to i plus one it's the same okay thank you yeah गुंजन uh, uh, are the answers here zero yeah cool so zero is the right answer because the indexing in an array starts from zero right so let's see we're going to give an input and let's see uh, all right so i think that's done we have to do something also then we can check the output next thing we're going to do is we're going to write a variable called double sum is equal to zero we initialize to zero because we'll be adding all the marks and then we'll be checking the average and i is also zero i less than strength i plus plus mark uh, sum is equal to sum plus marks of i all right i'll explain that code and then you go double average is equal to sum divided by strength and you want to output that first let's look at how the code works i mean let's look at the code working so let's say there are 10 students in the class one the marks are 1 2 3 4 8 9 right so that's 10 numbers let's look at what the average is coming out to be so the average came out to be 5.5 so i hope that is what we were expecting the average to be now let's look at what happened here so as i've explained we declare the strength so i put this in a new line but i could have as well given it like this it would not have been a problem is just that we are able to understand that the strength is 10 and the numbers of marks are starting on the next line so it's more clear all right so the strength is taken as input so strength is 10 years then we said okay let's create an array of size 10 which is called marks then you took all the marks 
into the array first you came you took at the zero i is equal to zero you took one then two then you went on until 10 now marks has all the marks stored so how do we find average average is the sum of all the marks divided by the number of people right so we find the sum we declare a variable it's called sum it goes into the loop adds all the marks to itself so basically sum is equal to sum plus marks of i so how that works is initially sum is equal to 0 sum is equal to 0 sum plus marks of i right so initially marks of uh, sum is 0 so sum is equal to 0 plus marks of 0 which is 1 is equal to 1 then sum is equal to marks of 1 which is the current sum plus 2 which is marks of 1 so that is the basic explanation of how we find the sum and then we just declared another variable called average which divides the sum by its strength and we output it i hope that's a very clear and you can see that this is now expandable i can write 100 1000 even 10000 100000 people here if i am able to output their marks i can find the average without declare without making one change to this code this is much better obviously than when we were writing one variable for every single student and then taking input and working with it right so you can see how loops and arrays make our lives much easier all right so now let's move on to something more complicated it's called a nested for loop that means one loop inside another loop or on one loop nested inside another loop i'll write this code here and then we'll take a look at what is exactly a nested for loop i hope everything is clear until now right if you guys want me to explain anything we can go back gunjan is there any any doubt or something that you want is in the chat or something no right um no nothing all right right let's clear this let's make the thing more visible so so there's something called white space basically c++ does not care about white space or uh, basically how much space you give between things how you how neatly you write things is something that is not important to the compiler you can see i'm putting in a lot of effort to make the code more readable because you have to be able to understand what you're writing and especially when things are getting very long things need to be clear to you because you might forget what you just did 5 minutes ago and if you are working on something with a group of people your code needs to be very simple to understand to be able to understand and un like it should be understandable right because then uh, nobody except you would be able to understand so the whole point is c++ might not care about spaces but uh, try to make something try to write readable code all right so this is what a nested for loop looks like you have a loop outside and then you have a loop inside so we're going to do one thing let's define a variable called count okay go to zero we're going to come here and we're going to add 1 it is equal to count plus 1 wait let's do one thing uh inner int outer okay so we're just going to take a look at how many times each loop runs right so outer is inside the outer loop and inner is inside the inner loop and then what we're going to do is we're going to just output it all right i want you guys to guess what the answers will be
Okay, so um, somebody asked when we use for. So for yeah. is just a looping oh, construct. Okay. Yeah, so no. there are many type. There are two more types of looping construct. We will see them. So generally, for is used when we want to uh, like we know a fixed value. For example, here he was doing from zero to fifteen or zero to n. And for is also very shorthand because you can see key in one line everything is done. So in, we can use for everywhere, but in general we use it for arrays or taking inputs or when we know how many times we have to run the code. All right. Like adding to what Gunjan said, basically it doesn't matter which loop you are using. You can use while loop, for loop, or do while, as long as it your logic is right, any loop will work. So you should be concentrating on the logic. The for is just a syntax thing. All right. So the types of loops don't change in terms of logic. They all work, do the same thing. Only they work in a slightly different way. All right. I think is that enough time, Gunjan? Should I run it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... There are a few conflicts in the answer, so let's see. Okay. Fifty and ten have been swapped in many places. Yes. So what happened is, inner loop ran fifty times in total, and the outer loop ran only ten times. Right. So. Uh, okay. Uh, I try run this one time. So it came into the. Um, uh, you can do that orally. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It came to the outer loop. It defined x is equal to zero. X if x is less than 10, true. So it goes into the loop and it sees another loop. There it defines y to be zero. X y is less than five, yeah, true. Goes into the inner loop. The inner variable increases. So clearly this loop will run five times, right? And then y will become equal to five, and it will come out, right? So then the outer variable becomes one. So currently, in the first iteration of the outer loop. Outer became one, and inner became five. Now this thing will repeat every time. Again, you come to the outer loop. X is one now. Now y becomes zero again, and this thing runs five times again. So inner increases by five every time the outer loop runs, and the outer loop runs ten times. So inner becomes fifty, and outer becomes ten. I think I might not have been entirely clear. If anyone's got any more doubt. I can still clear them, yeah. Uh, he was basically trying to say that for every value of x, just like whenever you enter that body, the bodies run again. So it does not matter ki previously what was the condition for the body, the bodies run again, and there it sees a new loop which will run five times. So since that y loop will run five times and the x loop will run ten times, so in total the inner loop will run five 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 for ten times. So it will be fifty, and the outer loop will run only ten times. So that is why the value of outer is only ten. So um, in this way, nested loops work. That the inner loop runs every time the outer loop uh, enters. You can understand it like that, maybe, or you can uh, whenever you're trying out, you can put in a few print statements like he did with inner and outer. So you can see which loop is working when and which loop is not working. That will help. Yeah, maybe this will work. Uh, no wait. Uh, I guess he'll just give one to fifty. Yeah, then one to five, what? one to five every time. No, no, no. Uh, okay, bash slash n is the same as n del. It just prints a new line, right? Now this should make things more easy. All right. Wait, I'll put this here. Yeah. Now let's look at what the output is. So first time the inner loop ran, it became one to five. Inner became five, and then you printed a new line, so it clearly shows that it's come out of the inner loop. Then it's gone back into the inner loop the next time the outer loop runs, and then it's gone from six to ten. Then 11 to 15, and so on until 50. Right? I hope it makes much more sense now. Take a look at this code. Take take a minute, I guess. I think things will make more sense now. Every time the out, as Gunjan said, every time the outer loop runs, the inner loop runs five times because y goes from zero to five. Right? Let's look at some more questions. Maybe if someone has no doubts, can we move on, Gunjan? Huh. Okay. There was one doubt just that. Yeah. Uh, go on. 
every time the value of x is so every time after one x loop is over the value of y is overwritten to zero again yeah 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 so right. yeah that is true because you can see that the initialization is done again and again int y equals to zero so whenever it will go to that statement it will initialize that again to zero i think right. you can continue now right uh okay Hello. So, uh, yeah, who is that? Uh, भैया int भी तो बार बार आएगा loop में. तो int y int y बार बार आ रहा है तो उससे problem नहीं हो सकती. हाँ तो okay I'll tell you more clearly. What happens is the loop variable here is created. Int y is equal to zero. And when it comes to the end of the loop, after the termination is false, it is terminated. The compiler will delete int y. so there is no more y all right y gets deleted outside the loop if you are declaring int y here let's say then you can't write int y here you have to write y is equal to 0 now y just gets reset to 0 every time the loop runs but okay. if you if you write int y is equal to 0 here and let's say you try to call y here all right let's see what happens yeah why is not declared because the compiler deleted this uh, you cannot access why outside this because why is the scope of why is only inside the loop unless why has been defined here int y is equal to 0 let's say and then we com- convert this to y is equal to zero. now let's run it oh, okay okay one second oh yeah i forgot a semicolon here all right so see you see why is getting printed here the last why is 5 every time can you guys see because that is when it terminates the loop why is equal to 5 is when y less than 5 becomes false so the 5 is getting printed wait i'll make it more clear yeah yeah so y is 5 every time right i hope that makes sense now okay let's go back yeah it's a, we have another question for you guys how many times will this loop run take a close look at what is happening and then try to understand until then i'll try to move this code there why by how many times will this run we mean how many times will let's say count yeah let's make it more simpler count plus plus you i want you guys to tell me what the output of count will be yeah just tell the value of count not how many times the inner yeah. and outer runs yeah this is easier to understand tell me what the value of count is let's clear the output everyone go ahead look at the constraints and try to get the answer okay we have um, we have some people saying 100 and some saying 55 okay so either of them nice. is correct okay yeah. one of them is right let's see what the answer is the answer is 55 and i'll tell you guys why so obviously count gets initialized to 0 same same routine it comes into the loop i gets initialized to 0 i is less than 2 which is i is less than 10 true now it now is where things get interesting you have to see that this is first thing i am sorry if any of you thought this was one this is not one this is i right if that was the problem sorry about that this is i okay so why gets initialized to i so currently i is just 0 so why is 0 why runs till 10 so count got increased by 10 in the first loop 
from Siddharth, you can do one thing. You can put C out for I and C out for yeah. Y. So that will take okay. the try run itself. Great. I'll see out count here. Hmm. And I'll write the loop number. Plus one. I'm writing I plus one because initially when I zero, it's loop number one, right? All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Will be the, uh, that after C out, you have to put those two. Count K plus L. Oh. All right. So loop number one count went from zero to ten. Loop number two count in. No. Okay. Let's try it again. Wait, I'm sorry for that. So loop number one count is ten. Loop number two count increase only by nine. Loop number three it increased by eight. Loop number four by seven. Then six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Now this should give a give you an idea as to what is happening. Now why is it happening? Because y starts from i. So if i is 5, that is the sixth loop. Y gets started only from 5. Okay, we can try printing y also. So you guys will get maybe an idea there. Let's comment this out. See out y. Let's write the loop number. See out y. Uh, all right. So loop number one, y goes from zero to nine. Make sense? Loop number two, y started from one. So it, it, it still goes to nine, but it starts from one. So it can run only nine times. Then it starts from two because i becomes two at that point. And then three, then four, then five. I think things must become more understandable now as to why it's running only 55 times. Because why starts from I and not from zero. If this becomes zero here, it the answer will be 100. Only because the answer is the why starting from I, the answer is 55. All right. Uh, Gunjan, if there's any more questions, otherwise uh, we can no. move on, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's move on. All right. So some interesting stuff. So obviously we don't have enough time to solve all of these in the class right now. But first off, I'll solve one of the basic ones and the one with the letters. That's because there's something to learn with that. I think we, I can do uh, number one and number one, two, six. Number one and number six. Okay, we can do number three or number six. Any one is fine. We are any. Yeah, number three and number six, right? Huh. All right. Uh, cool. Uh, let's start with this pattern. So we have to print. This here, right? Keep that in mind. Let's let's take a look at what is happening in that. So the first time five things get printed. The second time, four things get printed. The third time, three things get printed. The second time, fourth time, two things. And the last time, one thing. Right? So the more number of loops you go through, the lesser number of things are getting printed. All right. So I am going to write one loop first. So obviously, you have to print all these. So um, I'll write something, and then we'll see.
so obviously uh, you guys can see i have not mentioned what j is initialized to so if you guys can think about it for a bit and think of what j can be initialized to so that this works sure and then i'll explain why this works and how what is happening exactly think about it when i is equal to 1 it's supposed to print 5 times so this loop should run 5 times and then this prints a new line so this is where it moves to the next one then i becomes 2 it's printing it four times so what is the pattern that you see there come on fill it up in the chat so then when you think i should write the answer you guys you go on ten ha ha abhi um i think see you guys have to give the value of j for the entire pattern exactly it, it should not, not work only for one time it, yeah it should be such that the answer comes out every single loop okay so we have 6 minus i and um Five was there initially for some set five. Now many are saying six minus i. All right. Uh, do you want me to run five and see what happens? I'll just run five and see what happens, just so that we're clear. Uh huh. All right. Oops, that is not what we were expecting, right? No. Uh, why? Because every time it just runs five times five. So every time five times five stars are printed, then a new line five lines. Now let's see what six minus i does. right okay we have got the answer now let's look at if y so when i becomes 1 1 is less than equal to 5 true so it comes in you you have you know that you have to print it five times right so let's when i is equal to i is equal to 1 j has to run the inner loop inner loop runs Five times, i is equal to two in a loop. Runs four times. So basically, j is such. Uh, if you j is running only until one and j minus minus, right? So if you try to put six minus i, it makes sense, right? Because when i is one, it goes from five to one, which is five times. When i is two, it runs from four to one, which is four times, right? So base very simple. example of how a nested loop can be used to print patterns i hope you guys are getting the hang of how nested loops work now gunjan can i like move on to the next problem ha huh. i think you can if you have any more doubts then you can always put in the chat uh, i am yeah. seeing and i will prompt him if anything is to be done right so there's uh, another thing i don't think we covered ascii table right um i showed them the website the previous class all right so uh, If you guys have an idea of the oh, the next question we're going to take is this. First off, let's try to solve this with stars. Then we'll involve the letters in it, right? So first, let's print the star one. Right. So. Let's remove these loops. In the meantime, so while he's writing the code, you can also uh, yeah like, put in the code. I want methods. you guys to spend some time writing the code also. Five, five plus plus. Because there's five lines, I can run the outer loop five times because I can print a new line after every iteration of the outer loop. Right. So this will just print five. Now the inner loop, j is equal to j less than equal to and J plus plus. I want you guys to tell me the condition and the initialization. Yeah. Yeah. Very quickly, you can just say what is the condition initialization and initialization. Yeah. I am hmm. sure there are multiple ways to write it. Put it anyway. As long as it's right, it should work. And what should J be starting with? Uh, Some have given the conditions. So yeah. Okay. One and I. Right. Let's look at why that makes sense. Because when I is one, the inner loop also runs one time. When I is two, the inner loop runs two times. When I is three, the inner loop runs three times. So I'm gonna write one, and I'll just run it until I. Right. Right. Now that we've got the star pattern, and I hope that was simple, right? 
basically you have to see that the number the number of line you are on has the same number of stars on it so you run the inner loop those many times now we can move on to a more complicated question here we have a star how do you change that to a b c d e right so we have a very important pattern here also that is the ask i table helps us so there are two ways to set a character up you can write char c is equal to a that works it'll set the character to a but you can also write it as char c is equal to 65 but you will be wondering how that works right let's see what comes out when we'll comment this all right so let's see char c is equal to 65 see out c let's see what happens forget the forget the loop for a second here it printed out a but a is nowhere near looking like 65 right so what happens is the ascii table so when a character has an integer stored in it it looks up the value of the integer in the ascii table and at number 65 we have the character a so that means that if i were to write 67 i'd get c because obviously after a there's b and there's c right we got c so let's try to do one more thing let's try C minus one. Okay, that prints out an integer, right? Now uh, we can explicitly save that and see which will type cast it automatically. Yeah, C is equal to C minus one. Now we print C. Okay. Yeah. Now we got B. Uh, like if you guys didn't understand why it printed an integer before uh, it's not very complicated basically integer and character can be converted to each other's type right so when i did an arithmetic operation the compiler thought maybe i was looking at i was looking to see the output as an integer but when i stored it back into a character it understands that i am looking for the character output and not the integer output so yeah So basically, you can see that you can manipulate, add numbers, subtract numbers to still get a character, right? Now, let's say we uncomment this, and we can define a character ch to be sixty-five plus something here, and we will print ch every time. Sixty-five is the ASCII value of a. Okay. so what is this something that we put that it works for every iteration of the loop no i'm sorry this should not be in code okay yeah oh uh, you guys first tell me what the ascii value of what i should add to 65 that on every iteration of the loop the variable ch gets changed from a then to b then to c then to d then to e Also, uh, so that the CH will be out. Yeah, yeah I know, I know. Okay. Uh, yeah. First, let's look at that question. Then we'll run, we'll check the output, and then we'll see what's wrong. Uh huh. Okay. So, uh, yeah, few of them have said I, and also somebody okay. had asked why I put C in parent. Ah, uh, that I think I've explained already. Yeah. And see out that C. Uh, he put the parenthesis just for the sake of it. Doesn't matter really. He uh, removed yeah, yeah. the minus one so that parenthesis remained. No need of that. Don't worry. uh some are saying i okay. i and i minus 1 and i plus 1 as well <laughs> okay let's see uh let's see what okay i okay let's just add i you guys tell me what the output currently is i'm waiting for the output um he's asking that what should be the output right now yeah, yeah. yes you guys uh, i'm not running it i'm waiting for you guys to tell me what the output is hmm currently
Right now, okay. Um, somebody said PCC, DDD, EEFFF. Okay. Any more answers? I'm waiting for some more answers, then I'll run it. Let's see. Just B, okay. Okay. CH, somebody said. Yeah. Okay, let's run it now. Huh. Okay, so this is something you are not expecting, probably. I have given CH in quotes. So anything given in quotes is assumed to be a string and no, there will be no check for a variable inside. So the compiler just, it adds CH, it stores CH. There is a value for CH that is not equal to this, but it doesn't care because what I'm printing is just CH, right? So let's try to remove the quotes here. I was, that was just to show you guys that quotes are important. Now let's try to print CH. Now you guys uh, guess the output again. Yeah, see here is the output. Let's see. Oh, huh. okay. Yeah. So it started BCC. with C instead of A, but we were looking to start it like so. We went one up. Like basically, this is how you will be able to understand what is wrong with the program. You saw that okay. You thought sixty five plus I is right. Then you realize when you saw the output that B is the first one that's coming up. So it's obvious that A is one behind B, and you can notice the pattern that everything is one up. So what you're going to do is you're going to just go here and subtract one and then try to see the output if it works. This, this is how you're going to be. You're not always going to be right as a programmer, right? You're going to try things and then look at how things are working out. And now it worked. So we just had to write. Okay, we can make it easier. 64 plus I also works the same, right? Now I hope you guys understood how characters work and stuff like that. Let's look at the next part of the lecture. So the rest of the patterns are homework for you guys to try out. If you guys have any problems, put on the channel for discussion. We'll be happy to help you with the doubts. There are some interesting problems. Good luck. Then, okay, let's look at a different kind of loop. First thing I'd like to clear is all the loops are same if your logic is right. While loop cannot do something that a for loop can do, or I mean, a while loop cannot do something that a for loop also cannot do. All right, they are both equivalent mostly. It's just that in a while loop, you only have to put the condition. Everything else is up to you. So I think if there's okay, there's no example. Right. So if I want to run run a loop, let's say if I want to run a for loop from one to five, I can just write int i is equal to one, i less than equal to five, i plus plus and run that's the for loop right but if i want to run a while loop i have to first declare in w is equal to one while w less than equal to five run and i have to update w also by myself w is equal to w plus one or w plus plus so basically a for loop is a while loop comprised with everything coming into one line this and this are coming in extra lines, right? We can compress that into one line in a for loop and both will run exactly the same number of times. All right, let's run it. Yeah, so obviously both the loops have run exactly the same way. Or has gone from one to two to three to four and five, and then while has gone, it's basically the same. Only while takes up a few more lines. That is the entire thing. There's nothing else that is differentiating the two. Both are also known as entry control loop because as soon as you enter the loop, you check the condition. Right? We'll be looking at a loop that is slightly different in that respect. Now let's move on to some good questions that we set up for you guys. All right. So how many zeros are at the end of any given integer? 
right i want you guys to spend one or two minutes to think about how you can do it hint the modulo operator is used so if anyone can write what their logic should be they can write it on the chat and let's see what i do and if their logic also works Yeah, the question is that you will be given an integer as an input, and you will have to say how many zeros are at the end of it. Yeah. Obviously, we'll have to use a loop because the integer can be of any length. Exactly. And, and um, yeah, just okay. So we are getting answers like divide by ten until remainder is not zero. Then take mod ten until it give till it gives zero. Okay, first. Yeah. Let's uh, reminder jab tak yeah. not equals to Zero n equals to n mod n by ten. Right. So uh, I think I can start writing the code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are many answers which are correct and very well written. Seeing them. Right. So very simple question. Uh, let's go on and uh, give an input. Let's say we want to write um one thousand ten thousand. Let's say. Wanna run? And it says four. That is exactly right. So how does it work? So what we did is. We have a number, let's say ten thousand. Right? It comes. It got set into the variable x and n in ten. Then he set a counter to be zero. What n mod ten does is it checks the remainder with ten. What the remainder with ten gives is the last digit. If the number is five hundred and five, mod with ten is equal to five. It always gives the last digit of the number. So what we do is we check the last digit of the number. If the last digit is ten, we add on we add to our uh, counter and we divide it by ten. So what that means is ten thousand becomes thousand in the next round. That means the last zero is eliminated. Ten becomes hundred. Then it becomes ten. Then it becomes one. And at this point you come to the loop and it sees that one more ten, one more. A uh, one more ten is obviously to one, so that is not equal to zero. So it is false and it exists. So that is why we have counted all the zeros. Let's try another input, and I want you guys to be able to understand what is going on. Okay, so uh, I guess you can guess the answer. Okay, I'm running it now. So the output, okay, still running. I'm sorry. The output is three. Okay, so but there's another extra zero here, right? But we were looking only at the end of the number, right? So what happened? We got one zero one zero zero zero. So the last digit is ten zero. So the number got added. You added one to the counter and you divided the number by ten. The last digit is again zero. You added one to the counter, divided the number by ten. Last digit is again a zero. Added one to the counter, divided the number by ten. Now the last digit is one, which is not equal to zero. So you exited the loop, and that is all. It doesn't matter that there was a zero before it. You just stopped here, right? I hope it's clear. Gunjan, are there any problems with that question? Um, no, I don't see in the chat. If you have any problem, you can yeah put it here. Yeah, we'll go back. I'll wait it. for 15 seconds, I guess. So very also, we, um, something you I must have know. noticed that. When we divide by ten, the last digit gets knocked off. So if we have seven eighty nine and we divide it by ten, what would be the answer? Wait, I'll write it more clearly. Here. I is equal to seven eighty nine. I is equal to I slash ten. 
Yeah. yeah. Tell me what is I, the value of i. We want to know what the value of i here in this is. This is something very basic about how integers work. Let's try to do it here. Okay, seventy-eight. I am getting the answer. Yeah, seventy-eight is the correct answer because it is an integer, so it will discard any fractional part that it will have. So it will not be seventy-eight point nine. That is not possible with an integer. So yeah, you got it correct. And you should always keep this in mind. It happens a lot, especially in that average question he was uh, solving. So first you will take out the sum using an int, for example, and then you will divide it by five or three. And then you will forget about the decimal place entirely. So keep these things in mind. Right. Oh, uh, also, no okay. Yeah, I'm going to. What no, else? No, no, you go. What if we want to calculate all the zeros not in the last one? Yeah, we will give you a question. Okay, we can do that also. Who digits? Well, I think we will go there. So in that only we can just put a check. Okay, we'll get a digit. Right. So the next question is. There is a function x plus x plus x plus x square plus x cube. Okay. One thing is very obvious. This is a strictly increasing function. All right. So what we have to find is the value, the smallest value of x, where f of x becomes greater than 425, and x is an integer. All right. So obviously you have to set a lower bound, and since it's a strictly increasing one, you can clearly see zero. That if you put f of zero. The answer is zero, so you can definitely start searching zero upward. And the minute you find it to be greater than four twenty five, you can come out of the loop, right? You guys can give me the logic for this. Uh, I'll give you guys a few seconds. We are just basically showing where loops are helpful. Yeah. yeah. First integer where f of x is greater than 425, right? So, Gunjan, uh, are are people able to write stuff in the chat or? Um, not yet. Okay. Yeah, we are just waiting. You can put up a condition at least. You can just yeah, give right. a condition on when. Uh, yeah, what should be put in the loop essentially? Uh, I think this is a slightly larger one, so we'll give them a few seconds. Mm-hmm. Also, if you are still not aware how to do a square or a cube, uh, that also you can. We will show you. It is very simple. Just multiplying. Yeah. Which has a different name. Uh, okay. So somebody said file f x. So you don't know the value of f x, right? C plus plus does not know what is f x. So either you will have to recalculate it at every step, or, or you can just put a condition directly in the file itself. So. Hmm. I All think right. you can write the code. Uh, All right. So um, let's see. For int, since we said the lower bound to be zero, I'll start from okay. And uh, I will not write a condition. I'll I'll just increase by one. Okay. Now here I will check if x uh, i plus. Let's replace this i x. If x plus x star x, which is x square plus x star x star x, is greater than 425. See out x. All right. So very simple program here. We keep doing this. Ah, uh, is there? Can you guys guess the output of this program? Yeah, you can just say what will be the output for this. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think you have must have not calculated the value of x. Uh, but the. Ah, I think the uh, answer to the original the... question is eight, right? So mm -hmm. eight is the first number where this is true. Okay, so uh, okay, so many are saying eight, nine, ten, eleven in that way. If eight is the first one. Yeah. Let's see. Right, so we got a runtime error, and so it ran till infinity. Basically, 
and because there was no check to tell it what to do after it has reached the first number so what we're going to do is we're going to learn a new part in today's uh, class is something called a break statement so what it does is as soon as it saw that something uh, had some condition wherever you want is fulfilled when you put a break statement it comes out of the innermost loop it is in so the loop it is currently inside it will come out of so the first time it sees that it is greater than 425 it will print it and it will exit the loop that is pretty much it let's run it now so it has just outputted it right because uh, it broke out of the loop right so i hope that question is also clear now Right. Yeah, this is a very interesting question and one that we will also be solving. The number of zeros we can solve it as a sub part of this. No, a sub part of the next one, I think. Find the number of digits in a decimal number. I think uh, what we've covered until now, uh, you, some of you might be able to guess how we find the number of digits in a decimal number. Take a minute and try to think of the logic. Yeah, it is similar to the first one, in the sense how we take out digits. Yeah. Is it possible that if we did not provide the condition in for loop, still it works? Yeah, the condition is optional, yeah. and if you don't put a condition inside the body also, then what will happen is Q or loop will go till infinity, as we saw just now. So it is better to put a condition in the for for a statement itself, but if for some reason, like in our case, we did not want to put it there, then inside the body we will have to put a break statement. Otherwise, it will run till forever. Also, on your machine, uh, see it, it was on an online compiler, so it stopped after a certain point. But on your machine, it will not stop. Most probably, it will keep running. Yeah. So you can press Control C to stop the termination uh, to terminate the program essentially. So if, if any time you get stuck while do, doing these experiments. Don't panic. You can just do a control C and the program will stop. I think I can write the code now, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. While in greater than zero, counter plus plus and n divided equals to 10. Yeah. Yeah. People have said it. So we're going to take the input of the number first. So int n, C n n. Next, what we're going to do is I'm going to write a condition. Might not make a lot of sense at first, but you'll soon understand why. n is not equal to zero. Okay, let's keep the counter variable in counter is equal to zero. Counter plus plus. Right? And n is equal to n slash ten. Alright. What this does is it's going to knock off one digit at a time. Because we already discussed why n is equal to n slash ten removes the last digit. For example, fifty six by ten when fifty six is an integer. Is equal to not 5.6. It is equal to 5. 5. Right? If 56 is a double and you are then dividing, then you will definitely get a 5.6. Since it's an integer, you'll get a 5. So 6 has been knocked off the integer, right? So that way we just remove one integer, we count, we increase the count by 1. Now if we divide 5 by 10, This will not return 0 0.5. It will return. It is equal to 0. It will return 0. Right? So I hope I've explained it. And now you just got to go ahead and print the counter. Wait, I didn't even give an input. Okay. That happens sometimes uh, if you don't give an input, uh, a garbage value is just understood. Let's give an input. Uh, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, yeah. See, it has found that there are seven digits in this number. If we were to add another integer. Right? So I hope, uh, it's clear now how we solve this question. Is there any doubt, Gunjan? No. Cool.
Okay, we can move on to the next question, which is. And then, okay, yeah, this is just the, wait. Mm, yeah, yeah, this, okay. This is the explanation. Yeah, basically dividing by 10 power X will remove the last X digits, right? So 10 power one is what we were using. So we'll just remove the last digit. This is also something you can use in hand. Like the I digit from the back is just simple math. If you run, if you write it on a piece of paper, you'll be able to understand why this is true. All right. Uh, yeah, we can move ahead. This is just the explanation of how we ran that program. Yeah, you're free to do this uh, computations by hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After this, yeah. If anyone wants any more explanation of what is happening here, you can go on and tell me now. Otherwise, I think it's explained well enough. Um, Shivam, what is not understandable, like the number of digits or the random value thing? Okay, so okay, so what happened at that point was he initialized int n, but he did not initialize it with n equals to zero. Oh, so what yeah. the compiler basically, मतलब uh, that is something very random. कि at that position there was some value previously by some other program. So compiler did not remove that value. It said कि I will give this storage to n, and whatever value was there at that storage, compiler said कि that is the value of n. So it is a garbage value. It is not predictable. It is it has no pattern. It is just a garbage value, and we yeah, we really ignore it. And it varies from compiler to compiler. Some of them compiler set it to zero. Sometimes they don't. So this is something you should always make sure. That whenever you are initializing a variable, start it with zero or blank string or whatever, so See, that you don't get this random. This value. is a random number. I have set and until then, but still some are random value. Right? That's the whole point. So, yeah, that is not predictable, and you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, hmm. that is totally unnecessary. That variable you will have to reset it. Right. Okay. Uh, I think that was right. Yeah, that was the code we wrote exactly. Yeah. So some other homework problems you guys can try out. Uh, basically, that should be a good exercise. Right. But after, after today, what we have thought for a while, you should uh, go and try this out. Yeah. All right. Basically, reverse a number, uh, see how many zeros are in the number, just not at the end, and stuff like that. You can play around and try to see what you find interesting. All right. Uh, and then some more problems for you, because initially we showed these problems using a for loop. Now you can try a while loop to print those yeah. patterns. So we gave you those patterns first. Try a for loop and then use a while loop. That is very easy, you know. Yeah. So it is very easy to convert from one to another. So you can see here our conversion is done. Yeah, we've written down the conversion also from for to while. I think I also wrote the code before. Yeah, the same exactly. thing. So same thing. Right? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think this is explained. So basically, this is the last kind of loop. It's called a do while loop. It is very similar to a while loop, except the condition is written at the end, right here. So let's, I'll give you an example of how it works. Yeah, and just to, just to keep in mind, nobody really uses a do while loop because it is an exit control loop. So first it will run for one time and then it will check the condition. Yeah. So that is undesirable in most of the cases, except uh, like when you're trying to prepare a menu. Suppose you have a program that has a calculator program that has add, subtract, multiply. So you want to ask the user. So you will want to display your menu at least once before you want to uh, like stop the program. So in those cases, it is used generally and uh, like we don't use it in general programming in day to day. OK. I think they have semicolon. Yeah. So if you would have run, like it doesn't work as a live while loop, like if it's a while loop, you set i to zero, it comes and checks the condition and Im immediately it says i is not equal to zero and obviously it will not run the loop, right? But in a do while loop, it's the other way around. It'll do the loop and then check the condition. 
why it's called an exit control loop. So if I run this, so zero got printed out, and then it exited the loop. So it's a very simple thing. Basically, it does what is given in the loop, and then it checks the condition. That was the whole concept of the do while loop. It's a not a very frequently used loop, and honestly, I don't even remember the last time I used it. Right. Yeah, it's useful for creating menus or choices. Yeah, exactly. Where at least once the menu needs to be displayed. So a do while will always be executed minimum one time. Right. Right. So we spoke a lot about loops and variables. So let's speak a little bit about functions. Let's discuss functions basically. It's not a very important thing, but it's useful to simplify code and improve readability. This is the, the last thing we'll be discussing today. It's a very simple thing. Like you might have been thinking, what does this int mean? What does int mean? And stuff like that, right? So yeah, I'll explain this with functions and what functions basically are. So functions, uh, wait, uh, it, if you read this, you probably will not understand a lot of things, but if I write the function for you, I'll, you'll be able to understand. Let's say we want to write a function that just takes two integers and input and finds the sum of this integer and return it back. All right, so what happens is you take the two integers and you see in them, right? That is a very simple thing. Now what you're doing is you're giving these two numbers to the sum function and you're outputting whatever the sum function is returning back to you. So this return int is what is the return type of the function. If it says void, it means there is no return time. It's not returning anything. If it can be int, it can be double, it can be string, it can be anything basically. All the data types have used, it can be any one of those. So int, right? So right now the sum is an integer is what we're assuming. So these are called the parameters. Basically they're the inputs to the function. So you took two inputs, A and B, you found the sum and you returned it. Right? That is basically how it happens. And the returned value gets stored, uh, comes back here and it gets outputted. So input, let's say, you want to find the sum of, right? So we're going to run it. Basically we got the sum. It's a very simple thing. You could have definitely, you can say that I could have just written uh, N1 plus N2, I'll still get the same thing. Yeah, yeah. You, that is right. It's a very trivial example and that's why it seems like functions are useless, but they are used in a lot of places where code is reused again and again. It's like, it's somewhat similar to how loops help us. Basically it helps in reusability. Like if you're finding some a lot of times, you can uh, use the sum function. Wait, we look at a question for this so that we can understand better. So yeah, basically the same code that is there that you create a function, it takes, these are the parameters of the function and that is the return type. Right. So let's try to write the factorial of a number, find a, write a program to write the factorial. If anyone doesn't know what a factorial is, n factorial is not, not equal to, n factorial is equal to uh, the product of numbers from one till n, right? It's a very simple thing. All right. So like five factorial is equal to one into two into three into four into five, which is 120 on simple calculation. So we want a program that will find the factorial of a number. It's a very simple thing. So, so what? Uh, yeah. yeah, just a second. Uh, you can write. And if anybody has understood functions, then you can, they can also write, put the function yeah, yeah. in the chat box. Right. What should be the function for a factorial. Very easy and easily done.
so you see how the main function became much smaller and much simpler to understand like that's the that's the whole point of functions that you can just look at the name of the function and understand what is happening to that number and what is the output basically you you can make the names descriptive so that you can understand what is going on all right let's wait for a few of you guys to tell us what the way is to calculate a factorial and then i'll write the code okay yeah so they are saying to get a loop from 1 to n mm -hmm. and um, right yeah. so we'll call this int s is equal to 0 or uh, 1 for int i is equal to 1 i is less than equal to n i plus plus f is equal to f star i then you just return f right i hope that makes sense basically first f is 1 1 into 1 is 1 then 1 into i becomes 2 so 1 into 2 is stored back into f then 2 into 3 is stored back into f 6 into 4 and so on right there's another complication in this question but we i'll get to that soon let's say i want to find the factorial of 5 i'll send the question let's see if this works right we got 120 let's say 10 okay let's say 15 Okay, let's say twenty. Wait, what? Okay, now something really weird happened here. How can twenty factorial be something negative? I want you guys to tell me what just happened. What the reason for that is in the chat, and what, how you can fix it. Definitely, twenty factorial is not this, this number, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you got guys got it correct. It is overflow, and right. okay. A possible fix has been suggested that use long or double, or long long. Okay. Let's say I use long long. and if you keep on solving problems like if you practice cps uh, you will obviously come across this problem where you will need to find out the factorial of 100 so that day you will uh, look for some other solution not even long or long long right so it worked you guys are right maybe let's look at 30 factorial okay so even long long has a point where it overflows right so there's only some range that even long long can go to so how we fix this is modulo basically we store we can't find the exact answer so we store the answer as modulo something and this is what you will find in most competitive programming contests also basically there will be a probably a long uh, there will be a this thing a prime number Uh, which is usually 10 to the power 9 plus 7 i think that's right no ha huh. so if anyone remembers the formula from yesterday you can write it in the chat yeah you must recall that we talked about using modulo in multiplication to avoid overflows and uh, we also saw two prime numbers in that lecture so they are being now put to practical use over here because this is something very common that you will be handling or multiplying very large numbers when you will be doing cp and um, you will not want to run into overflows like that so that is where we use mod right i hope this is what you guys got is this right yeah cool uh let's try to run it now So yeah, we did get something positive. It might not be the exact answer. Obviously, thirty factorial is not this, but yeah, it wasn't overflowed, and this will be something that the 
machine that is asking you to submit the solution is probably expecting right so this is just a small thing i wanted you guys to know all right <laughs> and i hope you guys understood what the point of a function is right so this probably putting this whole thing here is also still right but it just looks makes the main function a little cluttered if there's a lot of things you have to do it's a very small program and a factorial is definitely not an entire question it's probably a very small part of a long long part like a lot of parts in a question right so that's why you can use functions sometimes to make the work you're doing much more clearer to you yeah a practical place where factorial can be a function is binomial coefficient so somebody ask you nc2 or nc5 yeah so n choose 5 so you can use factorials freely over there right i think uh, that's all for today a uh, gunjan uh, the form for feedback i think uh, gunjan will put the feedback form in the chat you guys can uh, uh, feel free to fill please, it completely please, anonymous please. yeah yeah please go on and fill it it tells us how to improve our lectures It's just for us. We're not gonna publicize it or anything like that. It's all right. Uh, yeah, it'd be great if you guys filled it and told us how we can improve or what we are doing wrong, right? Okay. Uh, and that, so the yeah, huh? Go on, go on. No, no, no. I'm sorry. You guys. No, no, no. Uh, I was actually taking up a doubt, so you can say conclude. I was not you. saying anything. It's all right. <laughs> okay. So uh, somebody asked, if that is not the exact answer, how to print the correct answer? So that is something we leave it for your discovery. 